Good evening. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Rabb and have the extraordinary privilege to be the president of the phenomenal institution Hunter College, home of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. And it is a great privilege tonight on behalf of Harold Holzer, our Jonathan Fanton director, to welcome all of you to this incredible evening of conversation in honor of Hunter's great uh, alum, the incomparable Jack Newfield, class of 1960. So I think that's it, right? So Harold and I welcome you to an event animated by history that goes back 75 years deep into the legacy of progressive politics and courageous journalism. We gather this evening to honor and perpetuate Jack's memory in a remarkable building, the house in which Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt received as a wedding present from his mother, Sarah. The only stipulation, of course, was that Sarah kept this half for herself. We like to call it the first New Deal. <laughs> Eleanor would say she never knew where she'd see Sarah day or night, so if anyone here ever thinks they have mother-in-law problems, think again. <laughs> Franklin, of course, recovered from polio here, went on to run his 1928 gubernatorial campaign from here, and then four years later ran from, for president from this house. President-elect Franklin Roosevelt made this building his transition headquarters from November 1932 through the beginning of March 1933, because, of course, in those days, the inauguration was not until March. So yes, Maggie and Michael, this was the Trump Tower of the 1930s. <laughs> It was here that Franklin Roosevelt named Frances Perkins the very first woman to serve in a presidential cabinet, and here that they together agreed to expand the model program of old aid pensions they had introduced in Albany, a program that became known, as course, as Social Security. It was here that they added to their reform program minimum, minimum wage and child labor law, and it was here that the outlines of the rest of the New Deal were devised by the brain trust that met upstairs in the president-elect's library from the day of the election to the day of the inauguration. Needless to say, FDR did not get to formulate his policies or his cabinet in a vacuum. Day after day, a pool of tough journalists and photographers gathered to observe the comings and goings of visitors and to press the president-elect for news. Except that during that transition, unlike many others, the newspaper men, and they were all men at the time, did not have to wait outside and shiver in the street. Eleanor felt sorry for them and invited them to camp out in the parlor, the room where you checked in this evening. Times, of course, were different then. The press covered FDR critically here, all right, but by agreement, they did not report or photograph Roosevelt's disability. The fact that he was confined to his wheelchair remained something of a state secret for the duration. So in that regard, times have changed, and tonight we are welcoming prize-winning journalists who are at the forefront of this ever-evolving change. We welcome them in the name of another barrier-breaking journalist, Jack Newfield. Jack was a proud Hunter Bronx boy. We, of course, had a campus up in the Bronx, which is now our sister school, Lehman College. And that is where the men of Hunter College attended until we became co-ed on our downtown campus until 1964. So he was a Bronx boy. He often toyed, talked about the opportunities Hunter provided him as the son of a widowed working class mother growing up in Brooklyn, attending public schools. He was especially grateful for his experience as a writer and editor of the school newspaper, The Hunter Arrow, which helped launch his extraordinary career. One particular article he wrote for The Arrow about nonviolent civil disobedience earned him the nickname, the Trotsky of Tremont. <laughs> That's why we, get to, we had to focus on the Bronx. Let's just say Hunter was Jack's launching pad to establish his feisty reputation. Since Hunter was where Jack began to live his journalism dreams, it is fitting that years later he came to me with a proposition that would take him full circle. After decades in the newspaper trade, he proposed to teach a course at Hunter. So I had the honor of beginning to sit down with Jack to plan a hands-on seminar that would teach aspiring journalists the tricks of the trade he knew so well. Tragically, we lost Jack too quickly, but we knew of no better way to address the sadness and to continue what we started, and that is what led to the creation of the Jack Newfield Fellowship Program. It has thrived ever since through the generosity and leadership of his extraordinary wife, Janie Eisenberg, and the Newfield family. And I want Janie, you need to stand and so we can just say thank you and honor you.
And Janie is, uh, is joined today by her wonderful daughter, Rebecca Newfield. So Rebecca, you also want to come say hi. And I'm just going to have to brag that uh, both Janie and uh, Rebecca are Hunter graduates. Janie uh, from our social work school, Rebecca from our school of education. So in their own way, they keep Jack's brilliant vision of public service so much alive. During his amazing career, especially his days at the Village Voice, Jack introduced and perfected a unique kind of investigative reporting, advocacy journalism. As he famously put it, the point is not to confuse objectivity with truth. He did not pretend to be impartial. If there was a need, he battled not only to report it, but to conquer it. If there was corruption, he fought not only to expose it, but to root it out. If there were bad players, he named them. If there were injustices, he fought to overcome them. His typewriter was his weapon, and his conscience was his guide. Whether he was fighting for government reform or identifying the city's worst landlords by name on an annual top 100 list, Jack became the quintessential voice of the people, holding its public officials to strict account and fighting for accountability and justice. The motto of Hunter College is mihi cura futuri, the care of the future is mine. And Jack took his college motto and made it his personal mission. In a career whose highlights we could only begin to summarize in the programs at your seats, he made a difference, not only in his own time, but in, by inspiring a whole new generation of tough reporters to this day. For a number of years, we were so proud to run a new field program as a course in investigative journalism, taught by superstars like the great Wayne Barrett. And Fran, I'm so happy to have you with us tonight along with wonderful journalists like Errol Lewis, Tom Robbins, and Alyssa Katz. And think how wonderful it is to have them teach our Hunter students. And then this year, Janie, Harold, and I came up with a new way to refresh and perpetuate the program by transforming it into an annual public lecture. Tonight, the Newfield tradition is exemplified by the inaugural Jack Newfield Lecture, about whom one might apply many of the same adjectives once used to describe Jack whom she knew so well and admired so much. Tough, relentless, inexhaustible. I, of course, mean Maggie Haberman. Maggie not only covers the White House for the New York Times, but offers commentary on the presidency for CNN. And earlier this spring was a part of the group of reporters awarded the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for her aggressive coverage of the White House. Joining her tonight is the journalist who's covered different aspects of the White House, but on the same beat with Maggie, her New York Times colleague, Michael Schmidt, who recently won not one, but two Pulitzers. And as the president of Hunter, I have no doubt, Michael, that your success is linked to the fact that your mother is a Hunter graduate. <laughs> <laughs> We're sorry that David Fahrenheit of the Washington Post, who's scheduled to join them tonight, had to remain in Washington on assignment. Maggie and Michael, you have big shoes to fill in launching the annual Jack Newfield Lecture, but I can't think of two people who are more up to the task. You are two people who exemplify Jack's view that, quote, the job of the newspaper is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And we anticipate a great conversation. Please join me in thanking Maggie and Michael for taking time from their busy schedules, for their incredible impact, and for being here tonight. Thank you. thank you very much, and thank you for having us, and David sends his apologies. Um, when I saw the news broke this morning that uh, the Attorney General's office in New York had filed suit against the Trump to dissolve the Trump Foundation, I thought, great topic, and oh no, this is terrible. Um, so, however, I think that I think Michael and I will, will be able to to fill the time and, uh, and have a conversation that's part of a rolling one that we've been having for the last two years. Uh, I wanna talk a bit about Jack, so Michael's gonna have to just be part of the scenery for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, but it's, it's, I've been thinking a lot in anticipation of this lecture and I really appreciate those of you who were able to bear with us on changing the date. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, this particular column that that Jack did in May of 2001. He had had this scoop uh, about the New York City Democratic mayoral primary, which uh, featured a number of candidates, but the leading two were Mark Green and Freddie Ferrer. And Jack had a story that Al Sharpton uh, was going to endorse Ferrer in the coming days. 
Sharpton and balked when the story ran, telling our current paper that he would only endorse Ferrer if Ferrer backed black candidates for specific city offices. He, in fact, insisted the leak had come from someone else. So Jack wrote a follow-up column. Quote, in 35 years in the newspaper business, I have never disclosed a source, he wrote. But today and never again, I have to break that rule. Al Sharpton was my source for my column that disclosed he had promised to endorse Fernando Ferrer for mayor. I am reporting this only because I've been listening to Sharpton say all week that Ferrer was my source. This misdirection is typical of Sharpton, the trickster responsible for the Tawana, Bro Tawana Brawley hoax, for calling a Jewish shopkeeper in Harlem a white interloper, and for other cons and confusions. I developed my story directly with Sharpton over three lunches at the Knickerbocker restaurant in the village. The Knickerbocker will, of course, be a very familiar scene for anyone who dined with Jack. The story was set to run May 6th. He asked me to hold it until May 8th so that his ally, the Reverend Wyatt Walker, could endorse Ferrer first as part of an orchestrated crescendo, unquote. Jack concluded his column this way. Sharpton, he wrote, is, quote, just a con man who keeps changing reality as he goes along, refusing ever to give up center stage. Sharpton was on his way to improving his credibility. Now he has thrown it all away, trying to become a deal-making political boss, unquote. I could sit here and read from Jack's columns all day, but I do actually have a point here. I have thought a lot about this as I've been getting ready for tonight. Uh, and knowing that I was going to have the honor of having uh, Mike Schmidt with me, uh, <laughs> the column I referenced was a vintage Jack column. He exposed people abusing power, and he tried to keep them from using the system to game others, including reporters. He believed in smashing powerful people in the face with a two-by-four, as he walked in the door or as they walked toward him, and he was unapologetic about it. And I've been thinking about this piece for another reason as well. President Trump recently complained on Twitter about a New York Times story, claiming that we had manufactured sourcing, created someone who didn't exist. In fact, the story relied on a background briefing that a White House official gave to dozens of reporters in person and at least 100 others on the phone. There was a debate that surged across the president's favorite medium, Twitter, about whether to out the name of the person who did the briefing. There wasn't strict agreement on it, but I know where Jack would have ended up. I also know where Jack would have ended up uncovering President Trump, a figure who, like Sharpton, rose from the New York City tabloid milieu and understood how to work the media to his advantage. Another of Jack's protégés, Wayne Barrett, spent years chronicling Donald Trump. He wrote a book about him, one that everyone should read. But Trump came from the same stew of media and political cross-pollination that Jack spent years trying to explain, illuminate, and in some cases, dismantle. Jack understood how corrosive and corrupting power could be. I found an interview as I was preparing for this evening uh, that Jack did with Pete Hamill years ago. And Hamill talked about the growing class divide between the people who ran the news and those who read it. And this was, I think, after his, uh, his stint as the editor-in-chief of the Daily News. Hamill said, quote, the fixation on celebrities, which has a kind of nose pressed to the glass quality to it, has debased the papers to some extent. The notion now is that any banal thing done by a celebrity is of interest, and that celebrities are defined according to what a press agent decides is the best strategy. Like Donald Trump, for example. Who ever heard of a builder becoming a celebrity? Unquote. <laughs> More on that in a bit. Jack had a specific approach. Flood the zone, do not stop, keep after the story until change is affected. Janie had a quote that she gave to a paper soon after Jack's death where she said, quote, Jack had a theory that any bureaucrat could survive one or two bad stories in a newspaper. That's why Jack would do enough research and reporting to say, sustain six, seven, eight, or ten stories <laughs> on an abuse of power until it got enough notice to bring change. Uh, current, current times are testing whether ten is enough in some cases, but also back to that in a bit. Jack also embodied a specific blend of advocacy journalism. Shaped by his own experiences as a boy in Brooklyn, Jack did not believe journalism simply involved writing things down and letting people draw their own conclusions. The reporting allowed the reporter to draw some and share them to him. And that is at the heart of a debate that is taking place nationally about the role of journalists in the Trump era, which I suspect we will also touch on tonight. I first started working with Jack in the late 1990s, helping as an assistant reporter on a series about Brooklyn surrogates court when he was at the New York Post. Jack taught me about being unflinching, fearless in the face of pushback, and always mindful of the impact we have on people's lives, positively and negatively. He taught me lessons that shaped my career going forward, but two stand out today in the context of our current jobs. You cannot cover someone or something you hate, which Jack, I think, mostly did, um, and you cannot give in to bullying from the powerful as you pursue a story. He taught me the second one after we worked together in a 10 worst judges list. He got a call from a district attorney who knew well, he knew them all, but he knew this one particularly well, who was concerned about one of the judges on the list. 
This per the DA did not want that judge there. The DA did a lot of business in that judge's court and wanted that person removed. It was not asking, it was telling. <coughs> the DA warned Jack that he would, quote, lose all access to this office, unquote, sorry, I'm a very low talker, um, if he persisted with the reporting. This was a new experience for me. I was a 20-something, and I was nervous when Jack told me about it. I asked him what we would do, and he said, leave the judge in. You can't give in to that kind of intimidation, and we didn't. The DA in question froze Jack out for a while, but eventually came back around, teaching me a third lesson. Most sources always come back around, and one should never be influenced by how angry they become. Jack remained one of my rabbis, even when he was at another paper, until his death in 2004. I miss him terribly, and journalism is the worst for not having him, particularly now. But the tradition of investigative journalism that he helped create and instill in so many protégés or admirers does live on. Investigative journalism can and does take on many forms. The kind that David Fahrenthold conducted in the 2016 election, using crowdsourcing on Twitter and public source documents to unravel the president's self-dealing with his eponymous foundation, which has concluded in the lawsuit that was filed today. The kind of source-based journalism that Mike and I do or FOI-based reporting that has taken place on a number of fronts, primarily with the Environmental Protection Agency. This is a presidency that is, in many ways, a gigantic civics lesson, as well, not just about how the process works in government, but also how our institutions work and their limits. So let's begin with that. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with his work, and I don't imagine there are any, but I like to brag on Michael, um, Mike won, as Jennifer mentioned, not one but two Pulitzer Prizes this year, one for our coverage of the Russia investigation, and the other for his work uh, exposing Bill O'Reilly's sexual harassment settlements uh, as part of the Me Too coverage. And I'm really lucky to have Michael here today in particular because there was an important moment in the retrospectives of what happened in 2016. There was an inspector general report on actions taken during the tenure of James Comey, the former FBI director famously fired by President Trump, and the actions taken in the course of an investigation into Hillary Clinton's email server. Mike broke that story, the existence of that investigation in 2015, and it became significant for two years. So Mike, I would like you to talk to the extent that you're able, without revealing things that are sensitive, about the process of that story, getting it, contextualizing it for the paper, anything that you can tell us. Well, thanks so much for having us. This is really, uh, this is really cool. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the email story, which uh, came in March of 2015, uh, sort of grew out of being the low man on the totem pole at the Times Washington Bureau. <laughs> there was this Benghazi investigation that was going on, and no one wanted to cover it. And we had gotten beaten on a story about it, and they came in on a Monday morning and said, hey, you have to go worry about the Benghazi committee. Um, and, you know, being the, the low guy, I mean, I, you know, sure, whatever, you know. And uh, so I dug into the Benghazi Committee, a place where there was not a lot of people. I think sometimes we can do our, uh, be most successful as journalists when we go down the alleyways that there are not a lot of people down. And I was going down, um, you know, an investigation that was highly politicized that the mainstream media didn't want to cover and was just trying to, to, to learn more um, about what was going on there. Was, it, was the investigation a farce? Was there something actually there? And it's sort of going towards those opportunities where I think investigative reporting, you can have the most success. It's in those, in those niche areas where um, there's just not a lot, not a lot of people, not a lot of sunlight. Um, and it was in the course of that that I had heard that uh, Hillary Clinton had handed over 45,000 pages of emails to the State Department. Um, and, you know, at the time when you write a story like that, you don't always know what the consequences will be. And the consequences, managing the consequences, is not really our job. It's not our job to, um, you, know, f you know, to tip the scales one way or another. It's to... Um, you know, just follow the facts as much as possible. I did know, though, early on that it would be a pretty controversial story because when I came home for Passover that year, my mother, she says to me, she says, and this, you have to remember, this is early 2015, she says, when Jeb Bush is president, we'll have you to blame. <laughs> so um, that was the beginning of uh, email fun. That, it, that continues today with the Inspector General's report. 
it's not unlike what Fahrenheit did. Uh, and to warn you, this is going to turn into something of a back and forth. But uh, Fahrenheit picked a lane that nobody else was covering. While the rest of us were running down the court chasing whatever chum Trump was throwing, he just picked his foundation and went at it and pulled on a thread and kept pulling and pulling, which seemed to me like a lot of what you did in 2015 with that particular story. No one wanted to write about emails. No, no one wants to write about emails today. That is certainly, that is true. They do want to talk about it. They just they, don't want to write about it. Um, I, what did we learn from the Inspector General report that came out today uh, regarding Comey's actions and other FBI agents' actions in that case? Um, I think we, so there was this Inspector General's report on how Comey handled the 2016 election. Oh. Um, not a lot of new facts about what Comey did or why he did it. If you think Comey made a mistake in his judgment, I don't think that this report is going to change that. If you think Jim Comey is an egotistical guy who thought he could navigate waters that no one else could, this is not, there's not a lot of information there that's going to move that. But most significantly to the Mueller investigation, there's nothing in the report that raises questions about Comey's credibility. There's no questions about whether Comey lied or twisted the truth or shaded something or had political influence on the investigation. So if, if you're Mueller and you see Comey as a chief witness in this investigation, there are going to be a lot of people who don't like Jim Comey, but there are probably not going to be that many more people today that, that don't believe him. So for his credibility, um, it's probably still there. Judgment-wise, he's, you know, he's been ridiculed and will continue to be ridiculed, and this document does not help him. It shows him coloring outside the lines. Um, the, the thing, and in, in you, you know this better than me on Trump, though, is that we can sit here and have an intellectual or, or normal conversation about how... Baseline intellectual. Yeah, so we, we, maybe it's not intellectual. Um, about how... This does not affect Comey's credibility as a witness because there's nothing about him lying and it's more about his judgment. Right. I think that a lot of that nuance is lost and the president is very good at destroying that. Yeah, I, one thing that I think that people are not going to remember necessarily, and there was already a debate about this on, on Twitter earlier, as you could set that sentence to repeat, there was a debate about XYZ on Twitter, but there was a debate about um, early headlines, I think not from us, but from other outlets describing the report, went to the texts between these two FBI agents who were having these private communiques that appeared very anti-Trump. Um, so that what got lost was that, um, A, it doesn't set, there was no conclusion that there was any bias that impacted the outcome of the investigation, number one, and number two, um, that this was an investigation that found that Comey mishandled the Clinton email probe. And, and what I anticipate you and I are going to see from Trump land is some spin on the ball that goes to, well, it just shows Comey messed up, and you're going to lose the part about it. Well, it'll show that Comey, so the president fires Comey for all sorts of reasons. He's provided all sorts of reasons. Um, <laughs> but the main one that he's clung on to is the way that Comey handled the Clinton email investigation. Correct. So... In terms of the president's argument, the president's going to turn around, and I'm pretty sure he's going to say, look, there's a document here that shows that all the reasons why I said Jim Comey should go for how he mishandled the investigation are right here. So I didn't fire him because of the Russian investigation. And, and by the way, I have a special counsel's investigation looking at that decision. That's the chief thing that they're looking at there. So why do you need to continue to look at that? There was every reason to fire Comey. And... If the president can make that argument, that's a pretty decent argument for him to make. How does that work, though, since you and I have, have written, and, and we've seen Rudy Giuliani just say it, that a big piece of their argument, we, we know that they believe that Mueller's probe hinges heavily on Comey and his credibility as a witness. So if the argument is Comey is credible um, and it, it, what he says should be believed, how does that help them argue then that he's an unreliable narrator? Well, I see. The thing that I think Giuliani has done, and this is a very, it's a fair point, but I think that what Giuliani has done is he's just thrown everything at the wall, right. any type of argument in right. any form possible. 
So if I give you this argument today on why the Inspector General's report supports this, then they'll make that argument, but then in two days, we'll go back to Comey's credibility because there's something he said on his book tour that shows that he, he lied. Um, there's not a lot of stuff on Comey's lying. There's a lot of stuff on his judgment. There's just not a lot of stuff um, on his, his truthfulness. But we've seen, and we've had the pleasure uh, of interacting a lot with uh, Rudy recently um, for these joint this phone is, calls. This is an audience that knows Rudy very, very well. And, um, you know, Rudy's having, uh, if you can't tell, a lot of fun. And <laughs> is really enjoying himself. It's true. And, but what they're doing is they're trying to confuse the public. They see this as an impeachment. The, the only issue the president has that from their eyes is impeachment. And impeachment is based on the public's view of things because it'll be members of the House that vote on it. So how is it that they can push the public opinion in one direction and influence those House members who would have to vote? So we are both under a constant deluge of news and information with this president and with this investigation. Um, my lane is more specific to the White House. Your lane is more specific to the probe, but we've ended up on a lot of the same stories. How do you decide, as you are going about this week to week, what needs to be focused on and what doesn't? How do you pick a clear lane, sort of in the manner that you did in 2015 on the Benghazi hearings? I call you. <laughs> I, I could see him formulating that answer as I asked the That's question. True. No, it's, it's just true. such a it's such a gimme. It's true. No, um, but we do have a very rolling. We have a long rolling conversation, and this is actually what I had with Jack, and um, for for years was sort of a daily check in, at least once a day, on what we were hearing on specific issues. Um, in 2000, it was the Senate race in New York. In 2001, it was Mike Bloomberg's campaign. Um, I remember Jack coming back, particularly aghast from his first meeting with Mike Bloomberg, um, and not believing most, most of what Bloomberg had told him about why he didn't serve um, in the war. Um, but yes, so but, we have but, that I mean, but, conversation. I mean, in, uh, along those lines, Ma Maggie has a problem, which I don't have, which is that Maggie talks to everybody, and Maggie sometimes doesn't even know all the things that she knows. So you get Maggie on the phone for 45 minutes at the end of the day, and you're like, all right, let's see everything that's here because she's talked to so many different people and they're all, no one calls me. It's Everybody calls true. Maggie. Every time I look down at her phone, it's someone, you know, an exotic character from Trump world calling her. <laughs> and I, you know, so Maggie's got a ton of information. So sometimes we have to just be like, all right, well, what do you know? You know, and just kind of take it all and throw it down on the table um, because there is so much that she knows and understands and she kind of gets you know, why she's been so successful on this is that she gets Trump and how these people operate in a way that we don't. In many ways, uh, journalists in Washington struggle by treating the president, I mean, he is the president, but in this presidential way as comparing him to other presidents. And he's just so different and so unusual that you really have to have a creative, flexible mind. To look at it. He benefits from the fact that people try to fit him into a familiar paradigm of well, unlike Bush 43, he does, yes, it's definitely unlike that, but similar to, um, and, and I think that's where we all struggle. But as you are doing this, as you are figuring out the various strands of this, of this investigation, how have you picked the lanes that you consider to be the most important to investigate? So, um, what I... Besides talking to me, I appreciate <laughs> that. But. What, what I've tried, I, I think that one thing um, that I tried to do was there's so many different parts of this Russia story, whether it's uh, interference, collusion, financial things, social media, um, obstruction. There's just so many different parts, and that if I spent my day trying to cover all of them, I wouldn't get very far. So I try to immerse myself in one subject. So I've focused largely on obstruction. Um, it was sort of, I did a lot of the Comey stuff and it was an outgrowth of that. Obstruction is a lot easier than collusion because uh, a lot of the president's, um, the questions about his obstruction are things he's done publicly and um, he does not hide. But I think that, um, and Maggie doesn't always have this luxury because she has to cover the day-to-day -day news at the White House, but for, for us as journalists, the more that we know one issue, the better we'll be, like, like Dave is. Uh, with the Trump Trump uh, Foundation, yeah. when you know the terrain of the story, 
You know everything that's been written about it. You know what the next fact is that moves it forward. You know the context of what the new fact may be. And you know you have a greater understanding and you can be more successful. So and in our team, we all sort of have divided up into different areas. We have a, a new area, Gulf collusion. Right. Um, it's a recent addition a to recent the A recent addition. List. This Gulf collusion guys are weird. <laughs> our guys. Gulf. 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 G-U-L-F. Gulf. Gulf. Yes. On our team. Not golf. That's a that's a different that's a different era. That's 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 part that's part of the Fahrenheit um, endeavors. Um, you've been in Washington for a long time, or certainly longer than I have, um, and around Washington longer than I have. What a, we hear the word unprecedented constantly, and to your point about how he's different. What specifically is different in your mind about this presidency? Beyond what we know, beyond that we see something every day where we're seeing somebody tweet, where we are sort of openly talking about somebody financially benefiting from the presidency and that he, it doesn't matter. What, what are the various ways in which this is unprecedented? Well, I mean, sort of uh, along the lines of just the basic story that I don't understand is that I don't understand how the story, unless there's someone who's writing the story in Hollywood, how the story continues to outdo itself every week. Mm -hmm. Like, how is it that if no one's in control of the story, if it's just this president, you know, who um, has a different, a different approach than other presidents, how is it that every week is a better episode than the week before, and you're more surprised? Um, and I just don't know. I mean, like, who's pulling the strings on that? Like, how, do you, how, do, how does that happen in a way like that? Is that the president realizing that he tries to outdo himself? I mean, do, do you think he tries to... Do you think he, he says, like, what can I do now? Yes, but I think that, I mean, some of this is factors out there outside his control, um, like the IG report, but which um, arrived on his birthday, which a lot has been made of, but um, for the conspiracy-minded. But, but there has never, to my knowledge, been an American president who's been so conscious of keeping himself in the headlines, because usually that's not really what a president has as top of mind. Um, and so he, he told his chief of staff when he came in to treat every day like an episode in a TV show. And, and, and he, has, he has lived by that, right? I mean, so every day continues to be... I mean, Rudy was a great this. second season additional character. <laughs> you know, it's like, it was like this, you know, where did he come? You know, it's great. Uh, <laughs> it's we should have seen it coming, um, but we didn't. Um, I mean, like, a, a good example is, like, uh, Maggie and I went in and interviewed the president in July. Last July. Yeah. Last July. And he said that he never would have made Jeff Sessions his attorney general if he knew he was going to recuse himself. Um, on a mild reading of that, you could say it's, it's um, obstruction-y. Um, <laughs> it sort of heads in that direction. It certainly raises a lot of questions. Ish. Ish. Right. Um, and, you know, we, we came back, wrote the story, huge headlines, the left goes crazy, you know, this is a, you know, example of how he's trying to meddle in everything. And then we heard back, you know, in reaction from, from the White House that the president thought it, you know, I mean, the, no one in the White House knew the interview was coming out. They were completely blindsided by it. Um, and well, one person knew. The person one, who walked us in knew. Yeah, that, that, that was, was about it. it. That was it. And so there's all these headlines that things are going crazy, and... The reaction from the White House was that he couldn't have been happier. Yeah, because he because he said what he wanted to say without a filter, which is his. Also, I've just know, anyway. Um, I mean, all, look, all presidents are concerned with their media coverage, and all presidents feel like they're being treated unfairly. That is not unprecedented, but um, we don't usually hear about it in real time. Um, our colleague Peter Baker, <clears throat> the Times' chief White House uh, correspondent, likes to say that this is like having the Nixon tapes playing out every day. And there really is something, something to that. Um, what do you make of it when you hear the president describe us as fake news? And does that get in your head at all? Well, when he criticizes you, I know that you've really hit the spot. Um, <laughs> you know, and you know, he, he really likes to go after Maggie. Um, but I, but it's pretty clear that it's, you know, it's the fact that she she gets inside of his world in a way that um, you know that no one else really does, um, and it puts us in an unusual position of where we have to decide 
whether to respond to it or not to respond to it and how to, how to react to it. And sometimes, you know, I think we should just ignore what he says um, because he's trying to get us to jump off sides. He's trying to get us to do something that plays, you know, that we're, we, we make a mistake. And I'm not sure, you know, when we, you know, we beat our chests about, you know, in response to that, that's always the right thing. What do you think? Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that this is where I think Twitter is a disaster, but I've been saying that and then still returning to the drug every day, right? So um, I think that Twitter enables us to say things that we would never say in our copy or on TV, and it's just that we're not saying it in a secret chat room, we're saying it in public, um, and, and it just feeds into, hit. I mean, one of the, um, somebody was tweeting out uh, a bit yesterday, I, I think it was a former CNN reporter named Peter Hamby, was tweeting out a page from uh, Halberstam's book on McCarthy, and it talked about how McCarthy knew how to use journalists' processes against them, and I think that's something that Trump is really expert at. Um, and people like Wayne Barrett, who had covered him for many years, understood that, knew where to find the tricks, um, could see where the seams were and point to it. So for instance, I remember getting an email from Wayne, um, who I still can't believe passed away right, right before Trump was inaugurated, um, but getting an email from Wayne in the middle of 2016 saying, this third party candidate thing is a Roger Stone play um, Roger Stone being the longest serving advisor to Trump, who's constantly both on the ins and on the outs. Um, you need to figure out where Stone is running these candidates, Jill Stein and, and Gary Johnson. And indeed, Stone had worked for Johnson in 2012. Um, but Wayne could just see what the playbook was. And I think that people in, in New York who have a specific, the fi what I discovered in 2016 was that the fiber of view of Trump was just completely different than the way most of the rest of the country saw him, because he was known as, as Jack said about Sharpton, once upon a time, he was known as sort of a con man, right, who worked for the media. In the five boroughs. In the five boroughs, or four boroughs. Staten Island, I don't think viewed him that way. But, um, <laughs> but in four of the, bureau, the boroughs. But, but in, in, like, I'd go to Iowa, and they would start talking about The Apprentice as if that had been a documentary. And it was like... <laughs> And I remember being really stunned by it, and Stone had said to me at one point that the, the line between news and entertainment does not exist for other people the way it does for us, especially when it comes to TV, and it's 100% true. So, um, so people saw The Apprentice as like part of his, his whole experience. Um, but I think this is another example of how he uses the media to sort of get the media off, off course. Um, but one of the things that Newfield always emphasized, as I mentioned before, was a refusal to be intimidated by power. Um, and so, yes, the president has over and over again said our reporting is false, or he has taken stories that. Well, he actually has done it so many times that there's some story we did, um, I think, two or three months ago, where he tweeted out in the morning, uh, attacking the story, attacking us by name, saying that it wasn't true. Um, I obviously saw it. Um, but he, he has attacked us so much. I was not asked, so this is the President of the United States, I was not asked by anyone, not one editor, not, not editor, one reporter, yeah. about it the rest of the day. Right. So the right. President attacked us in the morning, and it was so normal right. that, right. and his word, uh, we didn't take him at his word on it. And, right. You know, Barack Obama, like, uttered, like, coughed something about a story I did in, like, 2014, <laughs> you know, and it was like, you know, you would have thought the world had fallen apart. So um, he, he, he has, in some ways, lost credibility on our side in terms of criticizing us. But that, can that affect how we conduct our process at all? Because I think it can't. I mean, I think that one of, the, one of the things that worries me about how journalists approach Trump is that some people believe you can, you can therefore start coloring outside the lines on how we do our jobs, and I think that's a terrible idea. I don't think it's a good thing when there's a White House that you're going to, which you you are almost always sure you're not going to take them at their word because there's going to be times where we're not right, right and we need to have a discussion with them in which they say, actually, you know, it's not this, it's that. And if that trust is not there, then we could get in a position where it's like, well, we don't care. Let's just keep on lobbying, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, you know, we're not going to take them at their word about anything. And that's not a good place to be for us when we need to have a White House that is able to 
help us because uh, we don't know everything and we're not omnipotent. And we need a White House that can really help, you know, you know and we don't have that. No, what we always talk about on the White House team is just that these are all crises so far that Trump has faced of his own making. So what happens when he faces a crisis that's not of his own making? And he's got a press corps that doesn't believe a thing that gets said from the podium because it's been so devalued. Um, and I think that's where it becomes a problem. But he is not the first, he might be the person who does it the loudest, and he might be the person who labels us openly the enemy of the people, unlike sort of a Nixon where it's more private. Um, but he's certainly not the first person to, to try to undermine our reporting. Um, you came under intense criticism from the Clinton orbit for your reporting in the email investigation, uh, which has turned out to be correct, what you reported, particularly that she was under investigation during the campaign. How do you deal, and you're, the, the, the intensity on you has been, I think, less personalized, certainly by this president, than it is with me, um, uh, but how do you, you, but you have dealt with it from various places. How have you dealt with, and how do you deal with efforts to intimidate and how can reporters generally avoid falling into traps from that? It's hard, because especially um, if, as soon as we become controversial or anything, I'm sure you see this more than I do, as soon as we look at Twitter, we can see, you can see instantaneously what someone is saying about you, like at that moment. And even if we say like, oh, you know, it doesn't matter, it can have an effect on us in a way, it's like you just don't want to look down at your phone and see people saying nasty things about you. It just, and the, the Twitter atmosphere, I mean, it's a place where we sort of have to operate for what we do. I mean, I'm sure we could if, if um, we really needed to not, to not do it, but, um, and that can really, it can grate on you because it, you know, you look at these things and you're like, well, the, this person's saying this thing about me, that's not true and such. Um, but I, I don't know. How do you deal with that? Uh, no, no, nice try. How do you deal with that? <laughs> it's. I mean, um, the other thing that sort of I always try and come back to on all this stuff is like, in is like, look, like we're going to go out and we're going to follow the facts. Like we don't have a dog in this game. We're not part of the right. resistance. We're not here to prosecute Donald Trump. Um, a lot of the left thinks that. That's not our job. Um, we're, we're not his defenders, we're, we're not his friends, we're here to cover the story as much as possible. And the more that we talk about that, and the more that we do things like this, and we explain to people that like we're just out there trying to figure out what's going on, you know, like, I'm, you know, I'm not a political, you know, we're not political people, you know, I didn't vote in 16, I didn't vote in 12. Um, the more that we show people that, I think the more effective we can be because there's different expectations on different sides about what we, you know, what we do. The right has one completely different view, the left has another, and what we really do is somewhere in between. And I don't think folks appreciate that. Yeah, I was thinking as you were talking actually that you and I are both in a in a documentary that I, I suspect that given our druthers neither of us would be in about the Times' this first year covering uh, Trump, um, and not just in my case, because I was 50 pounds heavier, but, the, um, <laughs> but, um, but that's certainly part of it. Um, but, but I just, you know, I, I tend to subscribe to the belief that we are, not, we are not the story, and that's actually where Twitter gets very muddying, too. Um, but what shocked me during 2016, and this is why I think this documentary is not a bad thing, is, you know, New York City... Is a, is a very intense media town. So I, I think that most people you interact with here, certainly in government um, uh, or in the political process, they're, they're fairly sophisticated about the way the media works. Um, they have some general understanding of it. Um, most people really don't understand what we do, how we do it, um, the way it works. And so this is what I meant about Trump weaponizing uh, our systems against us, is a lot of what you saw him do with WikiLeaks was rip routine process from context and sort of use it in a very sinister way. Um, and I guess I'm wondering how much of that you stumble on, how much more you stumble on that. Do you still stumble on that? With well, the nuance is completely lost. Right. I mean, he blows through the nuance on right. things. And these are incredibly nuanced issues, whether it's trying to figure out what collusion is or explain it or look at an issue like obstruction and understand the legal framework around it. These are things that require a lot of time and attention and are not designed for you know, short sound bites. So we're in this situation where 
we're like, oh, well, we're, well, we can explain it all, you know, and we can spend all the time and we can write all the words and as possible, but a lot of that uh, is lost on the country. And I don't know how, how we sort of break through on that. I think the documentary for us is, is a good thing because it shows sort of the pure, this is, it's on Showtime, it's, uh, if you have nothing better once, to do. Once a week and on, on demand. <laughs> um, it shows sort of the pureness of our, of our product, like just us at work doing our thing. And actually some, um, the director of it um, said that she was surprised when she came in to see how much we were not um, as liberal as she thought we were. That's saying, right, I forgot about that. Yeah, one. she's yeah. saying that, you know, I came in and, you know, I had one view of the New York Times, I'd read it since I was a kid, and I came in and I thought it was going to be one thing, and, you know, you guys are really just kind of like, you know, wandering out there trying to figure out what's going on. And the problem is, though, on something like that is that the only people that are going to watch a Showtime documentary about us are probably people that are, you know, really like us already, um, or really don't like us. And so how do we reach more into the country? We both do a fair amount of television. I think that when we go on television and we show ourselves to, we're not pundits, we're surrounded by pundits, there's pundits everywhere, but we're just people talking about our reporting, Maggie's talking about how Trump views things, or I'm trying to explain something about the Mueller investigation, the more that we do that and the more that we, we play our role as reporter, I think the more that we, we get that across. Uh, on the note of nuance being lost, what, what do people not understand about the Mueller probe? Just talk a little bit about where things are in your mind on that. Well, I, I certainly, um, I, I, in terms of the president himself, is the president in jeopardy? The bucket of things related to him is the largest on obstruction. We just don't know a lot about him on collusion. There's, a, there's questions, did he know about this meeting his son took in 2016 at Trump Tower about, you know, um, about getting dirt from the Russians on Hillary Clinton, his trip to Russia in 2013, 2013, 2014? 2013. Um, you know, what did he know about the release of emails during the campaign? But the president's issues are on obstruction, the firing of Comey asking Comey to end the Flynn investigation, his treatment of Jeff Sessions, and his obsession with someone who is loyal to him running the Justice Department, you know, his view of the Justice Department and how the Justice Department should work for him or, or shouldn't work for him. And that, we, we had a chance, we did a story a few weeks ago about the questions that Mueller wants to ask um, uh, Trump about, and there are just a lot of obstruction questions, you know, a lot of things about that issue. So that's where the president's greatest exposure is. The second thing that I think people understand is that the president, I don't think Bob Mueller is going to lead the president out of the White House in handcuffs. This is probably something that ends up in impeachment. The president... Or with an impeachment proceeding. Impeachment proceeding. Um, the president... Uh, you know, the Justice Department has a policy that the president can't be charged while he's in office. And Rudy has said that Mueller told him they were going to follow that policy. So, And you, others have confirmed that. It's not just, for those of you wondering, it's not just Rudy talking. Like other people have... The Rudy thing is actually an interesting thing because you have the president's lawyer out saying things. He's the president's lawyer. And then people question why we publish it. And they say, well, how do you know if he's telling the truth? And they say, well, he's the president's lawyer. Um, but Rudy does say a lot of things. <laughs> Rudy does say a lot of things. That is definitely true. Um, the president also says a lot of things, um, and we, we run into trying to figure out what to print and what not, um, but he is still the president. Um, I want to, um, when you were talking, I was thinking about a specific story you did um, that resulted in a pretty remarkable um, New York Times theater ad um, that we were talking about the other day uh, about uh, the president being feeling undefended, and I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about that because it has roots in his mentor, Roy Cohn, very New York figure. A lot of people in this room uh, are familiar with, with Cohn and his legacy. Um, so I'm just hoping you can talk a bit about the Where's My Roy Cohn story. So uh, the president, we've, we've learned over the, the past 500 days how the president sees the way the Justice Department should operate and, and work for him. 
And in one of his fits about Sessions' recusal, the president in private said, I need an attorney general who's going to be loyal to me. He said, Eric Holder was loyal to Barack Obama. He protected him. Uh, Bobby, Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy protected his brother when he, when he was attorney general. He said, and then he said, where's my Roy Cohn? And that's how the president views the person that is in charge of the Justice Department as someone who was, I mean, a fixer, mm -hmm. a personal lawyer, someone that helped the president uh, navigate, you know, New York at a young age. Well, and who constantly stretched the bounds of what the law would allow, right? I mean, like Trump's whole view of, and I have said this, we've had this conversation before, I've said this before on other panels, that Trump's whole view of, of executive power is that of a, of a C-list developer in New York City in the 1980s, which is how do I, laws, laws are obstacles to be moved if they are, problem, they are impediments to what, what I want to build. And so if you just look at his entire tenure as one giant, you know, West Side project, that's, he views the government as an extension of that. And he just, he, he thought it would be more like, certainly mayor, um, but like the way Rudy was mayor, where Rudy was able to force a lot through. Um, or, or almost like a, like a, like a, like a, like a clubhouse boss, right? Like a, like one of the patronage people who Jack used to write about, and like a, like a Meet Espos Esposito or a Donald but, Manis. But, but this is where his, the president's biggest problem has been, and where he ran into it with Comey, is that the president came to Washington with his New York view, whatever yes. his New York view of things is. And in Washington, for better or worse, we spend a lot of time obsessing about conflict of interest, the appearance of, of, of that protocol. That's true, but it makes it sound like the New York view is that corruption is great, and that's not <laughs> that's it true. either. <laughs> that's true. That's but his view, he right. shows up, and he did not understand the nuances of Washington. Right. He did not understand. It's an enormous miscalculation. Let's say that there's nothing wrong with what he did with Comey, but the things that he did with Comey, to ask Comey for loyalty right. or to ask him to, to let Flynn go. It's just a giant miscalculation about how Washington operates to not realize that those would be things that would set the town off and would be huge things, especially with someone like him who was going to be under the microscope. He just, and, I st he, and he hasn't really changed. No. I mean, he's, he's a grown man. He's 72 today? I think. 73? One or two, but yeah. Um, so he's not going to change. Um, but back on the, the stuff we were saying before, he also doesn't hide things. He's like sort of like transparent in an interesting like way. You can ask him a question. He'll tell you what he thinks about it. It may not be accurate, um, it may be offensive, it may, but he will tell you what he thinks about it. Well, it was, there's not a whole lot of, um, there's not a lot of hidden motive, right? I mean, it's a lot like, um, there was this um, mock-up cartoon, I think it might have been a New Yorker cartoon at one point during the campaign, where um, there, were, uh, there was a wolf wearing a, a sheep's costume on the, or sheep costume on, the, on, the, on a poster board, like a giant uh, advertising board, and it was, um, I'm going to rob you, is, is what the, the wolf in sheep's clothing was saying. And the two sheep looking at it said, he really tells it like it is. And, like, and that's like, I mean, anybody who is surprised at what he is doing was asleep for all of 2015 and 16. There's just nothing. He just, if anything, he was more reticent during 2017 for most of it because he was really scared and uncertain in a new job and that he didn't understand, and now he believes he has figured it out. I'm not saying he has figured it out. I'm saying he believes he has figured it out. And so that's, but, I mean, in, I've learned this from you just um, about him, but I think what his, his greatest strength for what he wants to do is his ability to continue on, where if you had made said some of the things that he had said early on, you would have right. gone home and said, I'm never coming back to public life. And he is completely undeterred by that and just continues to go. And, and nothing, you, you know, it, it has no impact on him. He cannot be shamed. Right, I was going to say, he's not going to be, he won't be shamed. That's what it is. He cannot be yeah. shamed. And he continues to go and go right. and go, right. where well, I think a lot of people would have given up a long time ago. Well, that's, I think, where, where he's a challenge to cover in general, and I think that's where people who do expect us to be part of the resistance or the opposition, you know, he labels us the opposition party, and we try not to be that, um, but we do need to call out what he's doing and saying. Um, but people are used to the Perry Mason moment in politics, right, where, you know, you, 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 the person ends up weeping on the stand because you've 
you know, held up, here's what you did yesterday. And he'll just look at it and say, I didn't do that. I didn't, you know, and so there is no, if the, if the line keeps moving, you're never going to catch up to it. And that's always, that's, I think, the challenge of covering him for, for everybody. Um, is there anything in your previous reporting, and you have, you have basically dominated every beat you've ever had, um, but is there anything in your previous reporting that, that has prepared you for this or that feels similar to this? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I covered, I covered uh, drugs and sports for uh, three years, and then I went to Iraq for a year. I've been in Washington for uh, six or seven. Eight. And um, the only thing that is mildly similar to this, which was what I thought was the greatest story I'd ever covered before this, which was uh, Roger Clemens versus Brian McNamee. Um, and it had some sort of Trumpian elements to it because you had this big character who um, uh, you know, had a different view of the truth. And it was an, you know, this very dramatic story that played out. It had some tabloid aspects to it. And I thought it was the, you know, the most interesting thing I had covered. Um, but this is like Clemens v. McNamee like every day for, you know, 500 days. And for Maggie, you know, 1,000 days. 1,000 days. 1,000 days of brain. 1,000 um, days. Uh, I want to ask to draw a little closer to the neck of the woods we're in now. Um, uh, what is the current view of the, the Southern District of New York investigation into Michael Cohen, who is in a hotel not far from here, um, the president's uh, former lawyer? Um, what is the view of Trump's legal team right now about the threat that case poses? They think that they understand all the contours of the Mueller investigation and where the president may have issues and what the facts are and what witnesses have said. And they feel pretty confident about that. And they think they're, they're fine on Mueller. That's their view. On the Southern District, they are deeply unnerved because they do not know what the investigation is really about. They don't think that they've gotten a fair shake from the president about what his relationship was truly like with Cohen. And I don't think Cohen's side feels that he, uh, they have an understanding of what he was really doing. Um, you know, these are two, you know, people that have known each other, what, I mean, um, over 10 years. Yeah, yeah. It's not like a 30-year relationship. No, this is not a Roger Stone relationship. It's about, it's about a decade. Um, but obviously Cohen was doing a lot of different things. There's this whole aspect where he was taking money from companies after the president came into office to provide advice about how to understand the president. I mean, you should do that. That'd be very lucrative. I don't want to signing here. Um, I want to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to open it up. Uh, we've talked a lot about the investigation, obviously, and I touched on some of the government uh, investigations that that uh, newspapers have done, but what are the areas of the, I mean, I feel like so much of our day is just Trump is like, it's like a smog blanket, right? And we're just constantly trying to figure out where and get get oriented. What areas of the Trump administration do you think are, are undercovered right now, and where could reporters be providing a greater I think focus? the hardest part of this story for us has been the financial side of it. One, because it's confusing, and two, because we sort of run out of power after a while, and you, we really would need the power of subpoena to figure out what really goes on in terms of Trump Oregon finances. And we sort of hit a wall on that. To be a good financial reporter, you really have to understand how that world operates. And there's not a lot of reporters like that. And Trump's companies and his finances are not tied, they're not public companies. This is, you know, Trump org, is, you can't go buy stock in Trump org. So it's, it's very difficult to get any insight into how the money actually operates. How much money does he really have? What were his, his financial relationships? And I think that is where we have struggled time and time again on the story. But in a sense, we don't have the tools. I don't think we have all the tools to really cover it. Do you think that's another example of him understanding what processes will sort of shield him and the limits of the media? Or is that just by happenstance? I think it's more happenstance. I, I mean, we, I think in, we, we go back and forth a lot about is the president... Um, you know, this evil genius that is tricking us into all of these things, or is the president just, you know, um, some guy in his 70s that happens to be president? Three, three, three D chess versus 10 D checkers. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, with that, I want to open it up to questions. If I could just ask you to please wait for the microphones to come to you. Uh, I, I guess I'll call on. Sorry, I thought you were going to do that. Uh, the woman behind you in the red glasses. Um, what is the way around the Okay, one of the things I'm most concerned about is the attack by Trump in his White House on the three pillars of a democratic society, an independent, by, uh, nonpartisan judiciary, uh, a free press, and elections that can be guaranteed. And he's done everything possible to undermine those three parts. And what I'm wondering is, what is his end game in doing that? Why is he, I mean, I've heard that M Mitch McConnell has canceled the August recess because he wants to get all these judge appointments through before possibly the change of um, the House or the mm -hmm. Senate. Um, but what is their end game? And, and that goes along with the G7 disrespect and the NATO disrespect and, and love affairs with all these horrible dictators. What, what is he trying to do in creating this... Uh, legacy for himself and the country. I mean, I think that goes back to Mikey's point, right, that there, people try, try to ascribe a lot of strategy to what he does. Um, he clearly has motives that, that we don't know. I don't know what they are. I mean, you're, you're, the, the answer to the question of why does he continue to praise authoritarians, I mean, he's actually been doing that for 30 years. If you look back at the interviews that he gave to Playboy in 1990, um, he was pretty clear about um, how impressive uh, Tiananmen Square was, which is not normally a view you would hear um, from an aspiring American candidate. Um, uh, he, throughout the campaign, um, offered, you know, words of semi-praise for Saddam Hussein. Um, he kept describing him as, as killing terrorists. It's true that he killed certain terrorists. He also sponsored other terrorists. And so there would always be this one corner of it. Um, but we would all get lost debating the actual fact, and Trump wouldn't care, and would just move on to the next thing. I don't... I don't really know why he is doing certain certain things that he is doing in terms of uh, expressing less personal concern about readiness about the elections, for instance. Um, in terms of the G7, I mean, I think that's actually just more explainable as the whole, he will say whatever he has to say to get through 10 minute increments of time, and it's all about respect for him and what in his mind is going on for him at that moment, and what was going on for him in that moment was that he believed he was disrespected by by Justin Trudeau, whom he very specifically calls Justin, not not Mr. Trudeau or not anything like that, and it's meant as a diminutive, um, as he was heading into North Korea and he believed he was made to look weak. There's no, I mean, this is Michael's point about how there's sometimes no pretense, right? It was just very clear what this was. In terms of the courts, that's different. Um, that's Trump is carrying out a conservative legacy there, and that is basically the partnership that he has forged with a Republican Congress that is not doing a whole hell of a lot to provide an executive power check, as we have seen. Um, but I think that's a very different piece. And in terms of the press, I mean, what, what I find endlessly frustrating about his attacks on the press is that he doesn't even mean them in the sense that he doesn't believe that the press is the enemy of the people. He feeds off the press. He needs the press. So there's never been a president who could survive less without press. Um, but... Uh, you know, he he takes it all personally. So anyway, I don't. That's not maybe not an answer to your question, but that is a that is what the reality is. Yes, sir. Every every morning, Joe Joe Scarborough uses the word lie over and over again, referring to the president and and Sarah Sanders. When when does the Times consider it appropriate? to use the word lie in reference to what he says? And does the Times consider reckless disregard of the truth to be a lie? It's a legitimate question, and it's obviously been a really big debate, although Mikey is the one who goes on Morning Joe, so I might kick this over to him in a minute. But um, I, Dean Beckay, our executive editor, has talked pretty extensively about this, um, that he believes that the word lie um, loses power if you are using it every minute. Um, and he also believes that it implies intent. Um, and I tend to agree with that. Now, the response that we often get from people is, but you know, but he clearly intends to not tell the truth. Um, 
so much of how Donald Trump approaches facts is that he decides the facts are what he says they are, and that suggests a level of um, pre-knowledge that I'm not sure he always has. So um, he, for instance, and, and so here's, a, here's, a, here's an example. This instance that I talked about earlier where he said that the briefer didn't exist or the source didn't exist for the time story. I am pretty confident he didn't know that that briefing took place. However, I can't think of another president who would have gone out and blurted this out publicly without checking. And that's, that's the issue. So then the question is, does an uncorrected falsehood become a lie? And that gets into, I think, a different area. But our, our executive editor has talked about this, um, and we're both Times employees. So. Thank you for that question, and thank you for that answer. Sure. Um, I, let me just add one addendum yeah, before you please. continue, by the way. I think that people, to, to Michael's point about how he's not going to be shamed, I think people think the word lie is going to do something that it's not going to do. Um, and I think that it, this giant debate about when rep attacking reporters for not using the word lie is a lot of energy that could be spent on showing where he is not telling the truth. And if people need me to use the word lie when he says this table right here is a sofa and they don't understand it unless I say it's a lie, then we've got a real bigger problem. So, sorry, go ahead. My question is getting more confused in my head. I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> my 14-year-old daughter used to say that, you know, oh, that explains it, but it doesn't excuse it. And I think we're, at least I want to look back when we can all look back at this and say, oh my gosh, you guys were the ones who finally did whatever it is. If it's not calling it a lie, I, I, fair enough, your point is good to not call it a lie because of the reasons you stated. But on the other hand, by not addressing these contradictions or whatever they are. But we are, are addressing the contradictions. Okay, yeah, fair enough. I'm, again, I'm muddled. No, but it's I'm really important to... because what okay. happens is this has become a binary debate where people say, you're not calling him out. We actually call him out all the time. And so we have used the word lie. We just don't use it every day. But we also would, we say, like, you know, the president falsely claimed. Yeah, we fact know, check in like real time. fact check in real time. Yeah. And to finish. Sorry. No, but not it's just a, really no, important no. I to, actually, yeah. I, <laughs> dovetailing on that. <laughs> um, it feels like a crazy family where everyone's pandering to the crazy relative and I don't who's think who? any... Who's Who's playing which relative? Has, has anyone ever, ever had a relative like that? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I'm looking to you to, to be the, the people who guide me through this crazy time. And so thank you for hanging in there. We, we How's appreciate that. that. <laughs> I think that one of the things, this is, one of the things that, and I, I referenced this earlier, um, and I really appreciate your question. It's very thoughtful. I think that um, I think that one of the things that this moment in time has illustrated is the limits of institutions all around. It has Jack actually would not have been constrained by some of these limits, and so, um, but Jack um, was a very different kind of journalist than a lot of what most mainstream journalist outlets are. Um, I. I think that um, I think that one of the uh, things this has demonstrated is the limits of institutions, not just that you know. To, to Michael's point, you know, we don't we don't have subpoena power. We're not you know that we're not we don't hold hearings. The people whose whose mandate is to do that is Congress, and they're not doing it. And so I think what ends up happening is people end up um, channeling a lot of frustration toward us because we can and do say more. And I understand that, and I think people are understandably very scared and very confused. And I think that we are doing the best we can to just show what is, and I think some people are furious, but I think people have all three of those emotions. And I think that, um, I think that we are doing the best we can just to answer as much as we can. But on the institutions, I think that we'll have to, um, we'll have to see what the world looks like after Donald Trump. Well, that's know? also very true. You know, to really see what the, the impact was. If we're in a completely Very new true. paradigm and we're still existing in sort of the same thing, then we've obviously gone in a different direction. Yeah. If the country um, sort of has back to sort of where it was before in terms of the way that the media and Congress and the judiciary works, then it's then it's different. But we won't really know that until um, until it's over. That's a really good point. The woman on the end. Yes. Just wait for the mic. 
Uh, can you just uh, go over briefly the story that broke last week about the Times uh, source and subpoenas or? That's an, that's an internal investigation, so I'll, I'm, I'm I mean, not going to get into that, but if you want to talk about I mean, it. Yeah, there was a, we ran a story in the paper about how um, one of our reporters um, had uh, some of their records seized as part of a leak investigation. Um, you know, uh, we're very concerned in Washington about any type of leak investigation. The president has made that a high priority. I mean, publicly said it and um, has privately set set it for the Justice Department. Um, but it's it's a it's an area that concerns us. But it's also something we don't really love to talk about. Yes, sir. E you with the red sweater. Thank you for thank you for a, a nice presentation. Um, what is the secret to Trump's success? Is it it's got to be more than media manipulation? Other presidents have manipulated the media. Roosevelt was a master at manipulating the media. He went over the media's head with his fireside chats. Um, he had that uh, amazing voice. Reagan um, also uh, was very eloquent. John F. Kennedy. Um, what is it about Trump? How does someone like this, who had no political experience, become president? He defeated the Obama administration attacks. He defeated the Hillary Clinton machine. He defeated, uh, how many, 18, 17, 16 Republicans? Um, I, it, to me, it's amazing. There's something that I'm missing in the story as to what the key to his success is. You mean his political success? Yes. Or is it, um, it's a really good question. I mean, so I mentioned before the, um, I mean, A, a lot of it has been luck with him and, and maybe intercession in other ways. Um, but... Uh, I mentioned uh, earlier just sort of the people I would meet in Iowa who would talk about The Apprentice. Um, I mean, I have an example of that story in every state. And the degree to which he was a part of our culture, our pop culture for so long, I think really escaped us in New York because we were used to it, right? But across the country, you know, he would show up in, he, sh he was, he showed up as a reference in The Sopranos. He showed up as a reference in Sex and the City. She, he was... You know, his, his hotels were all over the place. He was selling vodkas and steaks with his name on them. He's, been, he's just been part of the zeitgeist for a really long time. So no one will ever be able to do, no rich guy is going to enter in 2020 from the left and duplicate what Trump did unless they've been part of the culture for 30 years. And he had 100% name ID and brand ID. And so people had formed their opinions of him long before newspapers started doing their dives on him. That was the thing that I discovered. Um, so that was a, timing, honestly, was a big secret of his success. The Clinton machine was not what it seemed, honestly. Um, they, they, they obviously um, were victims in terms of um, email hacks, but uh, they made a lot of errors uh, and assumptions that didn't pan out, and also, she also had been part of culture for a really long time and people had formed their opinions of her. Um, so a lot of this was timing and luck. I mean, the person who I think was the most surprised on election night that Donald Trump won was Donald Trump. Um, and I think that he would be, despite the fact that he will say otherwise, but I think that he would be, if you told Donald Trump of a year ago that the GOP Congress would be as pliant toward him as they have been, I think he'd have been pretty surprised. I think he expected them to be more of a force for him to sort of butt into. And what we saw this week in these primaries across the country is it is a, it is a cult of personality party uh, at this point. And so um, he, he sets the terms of debate much more than I think people realize in the media, certainly than uh, a lot of foreign leaders realize. I mean, he just, he puts the, he, he sets, he puts the goal here and he says, this is where I'm gonna be and I'm not gonna move. And sometimes he does move, but then he'll pretend he didn't. Um, it's 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 hard for his opponents to get their hands around. I, I don't have a more succinct answer than that, but I think that really is it. Yes, sir. Just wait one sec, okay, for the mic. Thanks. What are the six stories that Jack would be writing? That's such and a great question. What alley would he be going down? That's such a great question, and I was thinking about that. Um, I think Jack would be doing um, a frequent series calling out lies, untruths, falsehoods, all kinds of things that Trump says that are just not true and contradicted. 
Um, I think that Jack would be working extensively on the profitability of the Trump Organization over the last 16 months uh, and where they have done. I'm not sure I can come up with six right now off the top of my head, but, um, but that's two. Um, I think that he would be writing about the extensive um, swampiness of the Trump administration. I think someone like Scott Pruitt would revolt Jack. I think that he would be writing daily pieces about it, but Pruitt wouldn't be the only example. I think he would see Jack doing a lot of work on Betsy DeVos and what's going on at the education department, which is pretty uncovered at this point, and to me is one of the areas that's not getting enough attention. Um, that's, that's four, um, but in, the, in that general vein. I think Jack would be doing a lot more on how the government of Trump is working than I think everyone who is just sort of, as I said earlier, chasing the ball down the court in various ways are. So, and which I realize that I think that we are doing the best we can. I think we can always do better, and all of us probably should be doing better in a lot of areas. Yes, sir. I'm struck by how much Twitter came up in the course of this conversation. I was um, too. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> you referred to it as a drug, Maggie. I think Michael said you're on Twitter because you have to be in that space. Can you elaborate on on your view about Twitter, how is it a part of this investigative project? Is it a distraction? Is it a is it a critical tool? Are you there because the, the specifically because the president is there and his statements are now part of the story because they go to his intent, they go to obstruction, they go to these these questions. Um, and uh, how has Twitter kind of changed the day to day for you in reporting this story? It's, a, it's an excellent question, and I and I really was struck by how many times we both mentioned Twitter. I noticed it like on the fifth reference um, that we both said it. Um, so just for context, in 2012, I was the, the old lady who was scolding the younger reporters for being on Twitter all the time because Twitter was relatively new at that point, and embeds on the Romney campaign in particular were like taking pictures of themselves at events and tweeting them. And that struck me as weird because these are basically news platforms. Um, I don't, personally, I don't tweet things about my children. I don't, you know, I don't do stuff like that. Um, uh, and some people do. I'm always amazed when I see people tweet pictures of their babies. Um, I, Trump is obviously, a, the, was the candidate who used Twitter in a very different way. Twitter was just, was a big part of how he won, actually, to answer your earlier question. That was a big part of his success, was that people felt like he was talking directly to them. And the irony is the tweets themselves as this sort of direct feed into his brain, that's also not really true, because there's a drafting process for a lot of them, and there's tweets that they talk, I was talking to a senior administration official two nights ago, and this person was saying, well, I convinced him not to send XYZ tweet. I mean, so there's a lot of stuff in the discard pile, too. So we're, we're on it because he found this way to master it. And as, as I said about him setting the terms, we're sort of going where that goes. Um, it can be a great place to put additional reporting and context that can't make it into the paper. Um, it can be a great place to lay a marker if something is about to break and there's no time to... Times' editing system remains a lot slower than our Twitter feeds are. Um, I, but generally speaking, I think that it's, it's, like, it's like watching the sheen of a wave as opposed to the actual wave movement. And so sometimes people just see the sheen and think that's the whole wave, and it's not. You're missing all kinds of things that happen beneath. And the other problem with Twitter is that everything is shrunken down, and it's like the same size. In a newspaper, you can see what the newspaper puts a premium on. You can't on Twitter. Um, everything just looks the same. Uh, but to Michael's point, we have to be on it because it's where news breaks. It's become everybody's AP Newswire. It's an incredible tool to know what's going on. You will, everything I need to know is there, maybe because it is there, but um, the news cycles are turning over at a speed that's much faster than anything we've seen. So you could break a story at 8 a.m., and you know, by noon, the story's off in a completely different direction, and then by four, he's tweeted something else. And it's constantly moving, and there's so many different parts of it, just the presidency in general, and there's just, it just has kicked up so much stuff. And there's so much more media that is covering him, which is creating more stories. Well, let me, let me actually, let me answer that question, and then I want to say one other thing about what you said. We can't stop covering him, he's the president. Um, Baron Holt used Twitter in a way that um, was very different than anybody has used it, which was that he used it to crowdsource reporting, and he used it to make his reporting transparent. 
when he was reporting on the foundation and trying to find out where Trump gave the charitable money that was marked Trump Foundation. And it was a brilliant use of it. And it's we can't all do it that way, but it can be used that way sometimes. Um, I, I don't think the Times has taken a big view on whether it helps or hurts our investigative reporting. I think they've more tried to look at guidelines on how we use but, it. But the other thing on, on Twitter is that um, it's something that consumes a lot of our time and folks in the media's time. But when we look at our traffic exactly. about the amount of place of places that send people to us, Twitter is a small, yes. small fraction, and Facebook is yes. a big, big part of it. Yes. It's like Twitter is like four percent, and Facebook's like forty percent. Well, we will continue the conversation upstairs, but please join me first in thanking Michael Schmidt and Maggie Haberman. <laughs> and uh, President Rab and Janie and the Newfield family invite you upstairs for a reception in honor of Jack and Maggie and Michael.